Okay. Um, so as I say, it, it is a complicated novella, three parts. It invites multiple interpretations, none of which can be authoritative because there is no stable sense of authority even within the story itself. The narrator, we start by trusting him and as he descends on his voyage towards the Congo, he becomes more and more untrustworthy. We are given indications why we should not trust his judgment. And, the, and one of them is the character that he most admires is plainly a murderer and a very amoral man. He acts as if morality did not apply to his enterprise and what he should really be measured by is his productivity. He puts heads on uh, spikes of those that opposed him just to terrify them. Makes, and and, and the, uh, the natives believe he's a god. His name's Kurtz, terrible man. By the way, this, this uh, story, Heart of Darkness, becomes uh, represented in uh, the 1970s in a film called Apocalypse Now. So it's the American colonialist enterprise in Vietnam, that's at, or at least that's what's being deliberately invited. So Kurtz is a man, and we also have a Marlowe in it, famous actors as well. In the context of the Vietnam War, and the same sorts of things are being used there. Marlon Brando as Kurtz, and Martin Sheen as uh, Marlowe. Great movie, gotta see it. Um, and a takeoff on this. And again, begging the same sorts of questions. What are we doing here? Is this really, are we really helping? Or who are we helping? Is it, is it us or is it them? But it's considered a classic because it looks at the darkness within human nature. That is what it is for me at any rate. That's why I find it an interesting novel. It explores uh, in the, the same way that Ivan Illich explores the meaning of death. Here we get the meaning of human motivation and it's not gonna be very romantic about it the way the, that Wordsworth and company were able to be. Talk about the inherent goodness of mankind, etc. Civilization corrupted us, but real, we're basically good on the inside. Heart of Darkness will have none of that. It's, it's closer to a Christian view of human nature in that limited sense. It's below a Christian view of human nature because it, it suggests that the Africans are subhuman. But they, they don't get that from Christians. They may get that from Christian nations that no longer operate in a Christian fashion, because they start to see people who are not Europeans as subhuman. Now, final thing I want to say on this is the Christian missionary movement begins before the scramble for Africa. It's in the late 18th century, when William Carey goes to India, when Livingston, David Livingston goes down into Africa, the African Inland Mission and so forth. This antedates the scramble for Africa, really. It's missionaries going out not to colonize, but to bring the gospel to people, to try and put it in their own language and so forth. It's a very different thing, but it's pretty close. And I will tell you right now, and same thing in Canada, and that Christians are tagged with responsibility for the colonialism. Christianity is colonialist, you'll, you'll hear. You've already heard this, I presume. And, and in our day, the uh, public square is very animated by an anti-colonialist narrative and it specifically tags Christi Christians with this, but not Western uh, views of human nature. And I would say that's where the, the blame should fall and we should really start looking at what human nature truly is. And, how, and I think there's an opportunity for Christians to speak to that. But the narrative at the moment is that it's Christians who did this. And I would dispute that myself. Uh, for his part, Marlowe is not interested in blaming Christians for this. They're not really presented as Christians, in fact. But let me, let me start with the uh, story. I'll read a little bit. Maybe we'll get for the first part here today. Uh, we might do that. Um, and he's going to set a context for this story. And the context is, is he's in Britain, 
specifically in London, on the Thames River, in the midst of the greatest city of the day by this point, London, the heart of brightness, and yet early on, Marlowe is going to say, and this was once the, one of the dark places of the earth in relation to the Roman Empire. And that invites the whole question, what do we mean by light and dark and civilization and so forth? But Marlowe is a figure of trustworthiness. But note that, let me just read some of the, uh, the narrative here. And if I can pull this over here. Uh, the Nelly, a cruising yawl, swung to her anchor without a flutter of the sails and was at rest. The flood had made, the wind was nearly calm, and being bound down the river, the only thing for it was to come to and wait for the turn of the tide. Oh, personal narrative, I rode on the t River Thames on the, it's called the Tideway, it was a river race, and the, you know, the boats, the eights, that you see at the Olympics and so forth. I w rode something called the Tideway, and this is exact, the, the river, when the water comes in, it comes in so, at such speed, that if you try and row against it with all your might, you're not moving. I can tell you that the, this is what happened in the race. Like we're sitting there and everybody's straining, all eight. And when you, when you do that on a flat river, the boat's flying. When the tide was pushing against us, it, you're just barely moving along the bank, full speed. And then the tide turns, it goes from, from the flood to the ebb. And once the ebb starts going, and it, it did it right, and they timed the race, so the flood was still coming in, and then, so at first you're exhausted, you're making no progress, and at the end, it's just like you're going because the water is helping you and it's pushing you along. They're at the point of the, uh, of the flood when the water is coming in at great speed, and then it'll go back out in accordance with the tides. Uh, and so they're stuck, and this becomes a, a symbol to some degree, and he, he is very, strong use of symbolism throughout the whole novel. And here's a symbol of, it's uh, a symbol of progress is stuck on the river by nature. Nature has made it so that the boat can't move. And all they can do was wait and for the turn of the tide. That's how he, a fascinating introductory paragraph. Symbolizes something. It's not just contextualizing. It symbolizes the power of um, civilization in relation to nature. Nature really has the whip hand here, if you will. The sea reach of the Thames stretched before us like the beginning of an interminable waterway. In the offing, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint, and in the luminous space, the tanned sails of the barges drifting up with the tide seemed to stand still in red clusters of canvas, sharply peaked with gleams of varnished spirits. A haze rusted on the low shores, rested on the low shores and ran out to sea in vanishing flatness. The air was dark above Gravesend. Gravesend is a place, by the way, but obviously Gravesend has symbolic significance in itself. No death. The promised land, if you will, the Gravesend is an eschatological, the dead coming out of the ground and the second coming, Gravesend, but it's a, it is a place along the Thames River, and farther back still seemed condensed into a mournful gloom, brooding motionless over the biggest and the greatest town on earth. As I said, when Dickens writes A Tale of Two Cities, there are two that could have been considered to be the greatest on earth, Paris and London, but because of the Industrial Revolution, it is now London. This is the end of the 19th century. London is preeminent. Look at the pink areas on the map. Look at the blue, the blue is France, the pink is British, but you'll find that Asia is pink, Africa uh, we can see, but South America, Australia, Canada, the whole world's pink because the British Navy has made it so, and it's, it, this begins with the British Navy. The power of the British Navy is what has made London the greatest town on earth. The director of companies was our captain and our host. We four affectionately watched his back as he stood in the bows looking to seaward. Now, even the idea of him against the backdrop with his back, it's a lot like that picture I showed of you of the man on the mountaintop. We see from his perspective, but we don't actually see his face. 
there's a, a symbolism in, in every, every scene he portrays has a, has a symbolism. He, and he, he ties the symbols together and it has a cumulative effect. On the whole river, there was nothing that looked half so nautical. He resembled a pilot, which to a seaman is trustworthiness personified. It was difficult to realize his work was not out there in the luminous estuary, but behind him within the brooding gloom. Ah, his work was in the gloom behind him, not in the light. That's where his work, heart of darkness already being dimly alluded to, right? The director of the company who represents trustworthiness, who looks to the light, his work's still in the darkness, in the gloom. Between us, there was, as I've already said somewhere, the bond of the sea. Besides holding our hearts together through long periods of separation, it had the effect of making us tolerant of each other's yarns and even convictions. The lawyer, the best of old fellows. Irony, he's the worst. The best of old fellows had, because of his many years and many virtues, the only cushion on deck and was lying on the only rug. The accountant had brought out already a box of dominoes and was toying architecturally with the bones, with the bones called, have you played dominoes? What are the dominoes made of? Yep. So, and, and, and here again, alluding again, even on the ship, they're playing with the bones, playing a game with the bones. Marlowe sat cross-legged right aft, leaning against the mizzen mast. He had sunken cheeks, a yellow complexion, a straight back, an ascetic aspect, and with his arms dropped, the palms of hands outwards resembled an idol. The director, satisfied the anchor had good hold, made his way aft and sat down amongst us. We exchanged a few words lazily. Afterwards, there was a silence on board the yacht. For some reason or other, we did not begin that game of dominoes. We felt meditative and fit for nothing but placid staring. The day was ending in a serenity of still and exquisite brilliance. The water shone pacifically. The sky, without a speck, was a benign immensity of unstained light. The very mist on the Essex march was like a gauzy and radiant fabric hung from the wooded rises inland and draping the low shores in diaphanous folds like a dress like a wedding dress here's the bride of christ it's the bride behind us in a dress it's clothed it's bright it represents something only the gloom to the west brooding over the upper reaches became more somber every minute as if angered by the approach of the sun and at last, in its curved and imperceptible fall, the sun sank low and from glowing white changed to a dull red without rays and without heat, as if about to go out suddenly, stricken to death by the touch of that gloom brooding over a crowd of men. And I'm just going to just go over this. But then he will invoke, just skipping on a little bit ahead, he's going to connect London with um, nobility, and specifically with the um, medieval notion of chivalry and the knights. Think of King Arthur, the knights, the round table still being invoked here, but now the uh, field on which the battle takes place is the field of the sea. It had the sea, the tide on the Thames, and the tidal current had borne ships throughout the world. It had known and served all the men of whom the nation is proud from Sir Francis Drake during Elizabeth's period to Sir John Franklin. Um, Northwest Passage. Knights all, titled and untitled, the great knights errant of the sea. It had borne all the ships whose names are like jewels flashing in the night of time from the Golden Hind from Sir Francis Drake returning from her rotund flanks full of treasure to be visited by the Queen's Highness and thus pass out of the gigantic tale to the Erebus and Terror, the ships that Franklin had and were lost in Canada, trying to find the Northwest Passage, subsequently found in recent years, by the way. 
bound on other conquests, and that never returned. It had known the ships and the men. They had sailed for Deptford, from Greenwich, from Erith, the adventurers and the settlers, king's ships and the ships of men on change, captains, admirals, the dark interlopers of the eastern trade, and the commissioned generals of the East India fleets. Note that here he's even using scare quotes. The Dutch East, or the uh, uh, East India Company was notorious for uh, exploiting India, uh, taking the, the riches of India, the spices, etc., uh, and uh, doing all sorts of other illicit things in exchange, largely getting the Chinese doped on opium, among other things. No, but never mind, that's another story. Hunters for gold or pursuers of fame, they had all gone out on that stream bearing the sword and often the torch, messengers of the might within the land, bearers of a spark from the sacred fire. What greatness had not floated from the ebb, on the ebb of that river into the mystery of an unknown earth? The dreams of men, the seeds of commonwealths, the germs of empires. The sun sets, it goes down, the lights go down. And this also, said Marlowe suddenly, has been one of the dark places of the earth. Okay, so all of this build up to London as being the, not just the seat of empire, the seat of empire and the source of enlightenment for much of the world. By the way, in the 19th century, I haven't even mentioned this yet, but there will be a phrase that's used and it's used by Kipling in a poem. You know Kipling for the Jungle Book or Gunga Din and so forth. Um, and a poem I used to do in the class, but I've just dropped, but you could read, it's pretty easy. The white man's burden. And the white man's burden is to bring civilization to the world even though the world will hate you for it. Moral, there's a moral duty to bring civilization. And one of the ways in which the English do it is by bringing cricket all over the world. It's the only game where they break for tea and sandwiches in, in the middle of it. It's rather amusing in some ways. Wear white, they wear the whites for cricket, cricket jumper and all that. And, and it's very, it takes five days to play the game and at the end of it, it's usually a draw. It's the worst, <laughs> it's the worst. Very civilized game. G game for gentlemen, it's, it's inculcating certain habits and, and so forth. Played with great gusto um, in Pakistan and India and Af uh, parts of Africa, British parts of Africa. Um, Australia, New Zealand, hasn't really come to Canada too much until recent times with lots of uh, Indian and Pakistani immigration. I see it being played in Mississauga and places like that. But in general, Canadians are like, no, nah, there's baseball, we're not gonna do this. People win in baseball, well, I think we'll do that one. Um, but cricket, and, and, and Britain then is this place of enlightenment, and London in particular, and the sea is the means of enlightenment. But Marlowe flips it on the head, and this is one of the reasons that we immediately are drawn into some sort of trust in him. He is self-reflexive. He says, and this also has been one of the dark places of the earth. Earth. Now, this is the ship captain. Go on with this. He was the only man of us who still followed the sea. Remember that the, the man who stood with his back to us was the man who worked back in the darkness. This is a, a, an actual sailor. The worst that could be said of him was that he did not represent his class. What does that mean? The worst that could be said of him was that he did not represent his class. He was a seaman. It's sort of like when uh, Bilbo Baggins says that they're most excellent of hobbits and he likes some of them half as well as they deserve. And so it's like, was I just insulted or was it that's that sort of a phrase? The worst that could be said of him was that he did not represent his class. He was a seaman, but he was a wanderer too, while most seamen lead, if one may express it, a sedentary life. Their minds are of the stay-at-home order, and their home is always with them, the ship, and so is their country, the sea. One ship is very much like another, and the sea is always the same. In the immutability of their surroundings, the foreign shores, the foreign faces, the changing immensity of life glide past, veiled not by a sense of mystery, 
but by a slightly disdainful ignorance. For there is nothing mysterious to a seaman unless it be the sea itself, which is the mistress of his existence and as inscrutable as destiny. For the rest, after his few hours of work, a casual stroll or a casual spree on shore suffices to unfold for him the secret of a whole continent, and generally he finds the secret not worth knowing. At the end of all that, do you have any idea what was just said? It, yes and no. It's not abundantly clear. I think we get a sense that, that seamen are rather superficial and think that they know it all. Because they go to ports all over the world, but they never go outside the context of the port. They land, they have a few beers or whatever, and then they get back in and say, oh yes, I know that country. Their country is actually the sea. And, and when they land in the ports, the ports are very much the same all over the place. There are taverns, there's food, there's other things in ports, I'll pass over. Um, but the yarns of semen have a direct simplicity, the whole meaning of which lies within the shell of a cracked nut. So already we have notions of mis mystery. Remember, he was like an idol to them as well, the Buddha. The Buddha whose eyes are turned inward towards himself. He's going to be portrayed as a Buddha more than once. He's going to sit like a Buddha as well. He's inscrutable. He, he represents a sort of a wisdom that's not r rational, Western wisdom. Yet he's a figure of wisdom. He's seen as such. And at the beginning, we we're given some reason for thinking that. But his remark did not seem at all surprising. It was just like Marlowe. It was accepted in silence. No one took the trouble to grunt even. And presently, he said, very slow, I was thinking of very old times when the Romans first came here, 1900 years ago, the other day. Why the other day? Because he has a Darwinist account of things and 1900 years ago is just a short space of time. Light came out of this river since. You say nights? Yes, but it is like a running blaze on a plain, like a flash of lightning in the clouds. We live in the flicker. May it last as long as the old earth keeps rolling. But darkness was here yesterday. Imagines the feelings of a commander of a fine, what do you call him, trireme in the Mediterranean. You know those Roman um, vessels where you steer them? They have a small sail, but their slaves pull them along. Or ordered suddenly to the north, run overland across the Gauls in a hurry. Put in charge of one of these craft, the legionaries, a wonderful lot of handy men they must have been too used to build, apparently by the hundred in a month or two, if we may believe what we read. Imagine him here, the very end of the world. And if you look from the context of a, of a Roman map, Britannia is a, no Roman wants to go to, to Britannia. It's cold, it's dark. Um, the food's not very good. The natives are savage and brutal, and they don't like being conquered. So you got to put huge legions there just to hold it. And then even worse than the Britons are the Picts, the Scots in the north. They're just, forget them. you got to build a wall. They do. The Hadrian builds a wall to keep the Scots on the other side. So they're just like, ah, forget this. We'll just build a wall and we'll, stand, we'll put guards up there and forts just to keep, make sure they don't come raid and cause chaos and darkness, but they're just, these are total savages. The only thing that, that uh, is done with, with uh, Northern Europeans, they become slaves. They're otherwise good for nothing. Sandbanks, marshes, forests, savages, precious little to f eat, fit for a civilized man. Nothing but Thames water to drink. No Falernian wine here, no going ashore. Here and there a military camp lost in a wilderness like a needle in a bundle of hay. Cold, fog, tempest, disease, exile and death. Death skulking in the air, in the water, in the bush. They must have been dying like flies here. Oh yes, he did it. Did it very well too, no doubt, and without thinking much about it either except afterwards to brag of what he'd gone through in this time, perhaps. They were men enough to face the darkness. Okay, first mention of darkness. I think so, as darkness. There's, there are allusions to gloom and 
uh, and haze and, and images that suggest darkness. But I think this is, a, 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 I'm not certain of this, but it's the one that jumps to mind here. But, and they were men enough to face the darkness and, and they represented the enlightened world, the, the Romans. And they were conquering. And this, the, we were once the savages, we were once conquered. Now we're doing it, now it's in the reverse. Now we represent the opposite. And perhaps he was cheered by keeping his eye on a chance of promotion the fleet at Ravenna. By and by, if he had good friends in Rome and survived the awful climate, or think of a decent young citizen in a toga, perhaps too much dice, you know, coming out here in the train of some prefect or tax gatherer or trader even to mend his fortunes, land in a swamp, march through the woods and in some inland post, feel the savagery, the utter savagery had closed round him. All that mysterious life of the wilderness that stirs in the forest, in the jungles, in the hearts of wild men. Now here he's alluding by including the jungles in this, a comparison right away. There's no jungle in Britain, but there is a jungle in the Congo. But here there are forests and there's, there's uh, savagery and there's death. There's no initiation either into such mysteries. He has to live in the midst of the incomprehensible, which is also detestable. And it has a fascination too that goes to work upon him the fascination of the abomination. You know, imagine the growing regrets, the longing to escape, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. Yes. The slums of... He could be, but I don't think he's talking about that here. Uh, it's not an obvious illusion, but of course, because in Dickens' world, the, the inner urban life becomes very dark in many ways, not just because of the soot that falls all over London, like the, the, the coal fires make the whole city not covered in fog, but in coal smoke. It literally becomes brown, you can't see. It's not fog, it's, it's pollution. People are dying also from breathing it in and so forth, and, and the poor people that have been brought from the countryside to work in these factories or whatever, they're not doing very well. So it could be, but he's not reflecting on that here, I don't think so. But it, I mean, it's legitimate, but it, I don't think that's the reference here. Mind, he began again lifting one arm from the elbow, the palm of the hand outward, so that with his legs folded before him, he had the pose of a Buddha, preaching in European clothes and without a lotus flower. Mind, none of us would feel exactly like this. So analogy made, British, Romans, what's the difference? What saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency. We're committed to reason, my interpretation. We're committed to absolute conquest, total dominion over all of life. Everything's gonna be reduced to number. It'll be uh, Francis Bacon's science dominating nature. Nature is there to be exploited. It's part, it's, it's, it moves away from the Christian dominion mandate to be fruitful, multiply, fill, and subdue the earth, and, and, and to some degree to regard yourself as a steward or over creation, to pass it on. You sow a seed now. Generations to come will benefit from the fruit. This is to get more from nature than has ever been got before. There, that's part of the scientific endeavor. And there's a devotion to efficiency, which we call the scientific method. It's a methodology that eliminates consequences, just looks at the small little picture in front of you through the microscope. But these chaps were not much account really, these chaps being the Romans. They were no colonists. Their administration was merely a squeeze and nothing more I suspect. They were conquerors and for that you want only brute force. Nothing to boast of when you have it since your strength is just an accident arising from the weak, weak, weakness of others. They grabbed what they could get for the sake of what was to be got. It was just robbery with violence, Aggravate, aggregated murder on a grand scale, and men going at it blind, as, if, uh, as is very proper for those who tackle a darkness. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion, or slightly flatter noses than ourselves. Now he's applying it to African context. 
East Africa, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea only, an idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. So what we hear in Marlowe is a very interesting, sort of sophisticated meditation on the difference between Roman, the, the colonialism of, of the Roman Empire and of ancient empires, which come and go, and the modern European commitment to an idea and an ideal, which is total. It's not just to get the, uh, the stuff, which he talks about like a, a robbery on a mass scale, to get the gold, to get the ivory. It's a commitment to make everything in our image, to, to totally transform it so that it is a, a, an image of ourselves. And if it won't conform to it, to eradicate it. Because if this is progress, and this means, think of Dar in Darwinian terms, if this is going to survive and this is going to perish, we need to make sure that we're going to survive, and that will mean that things are going to have to perish. It's life and death stuff. The Romans don't see conquest as a life and death thing, other than that they might live and die in the way, but they're not doing it because their species are going to die out if they don't do it. But all the European powers in the scramble for Africa believe that their very existence is at stake if they don't scramble for Africa. Which of the European countries? Okay, they all come from, they're all whites, more or less. But which of the nations of Europe is the superior power? Which is going to survive and which is going to perish? They all go at it in the First World War under the same idea that it's, it's first of all, that the war is going to be really quick and they're going to win. They do. You, re you read the documents of the time. They all think, because of technology that, that they have, like, the, like, um, like towards the end of the First World War, they actually have tanks and so forth, but they have railroads that'll get troops from here to there at great speed, huge numbers. They'll overwhelm their opponents with guns, uh, with armaments and so forth, and the, win the, the war is going to be done in weeks. And instead, it's a four-year trench warfare, bloody, muddy, awful, in which Christendom dies. And Western civilization is gone. But because they were committed to an ideal, and the ideal was survival. And an idea. He doesn't say it here, but, but I, I'm reading it into it, and you can agree or disagree. That is the idea of progress that must be achieved. It needs to be pursued, not just willy-nilly, but as an absolute ideal that has to be done at all, at all costs. And uh, the portrait of the man that we're going to be about to meet uh, is best expressed in a man uh, written about by an author that I have not yet mentioned. I have limited time here. I'm not going to get through chapter one. That's OK. Uh, whose name is Kurtz. And Kurtz in German means short, by the way. I don't know if that's relevant here or not, but it could be. I mean, a little bit of irony here. Because uh, Marlowe regards Kurtz as a great man. It doesn't actually have to be short, but, but there's a little little irony in the name of Kurtz. And he is a man who is committed to an idea. And what's the idea that he's committed to? It's winning at all costs with no reservations on, uh, or moral restraint on his actions. He will kill anybody who gets in his way. He sends the most ivory back of all of the explorers. He is the one that he is the most efficient Note they said that it's efficiency that differentiates us, and it's efficiency that saves us. Salvation is an efficiency. Commitment to the ends, and the ends justify the means. It's pure pragmatism. 
And he represents this figure that I said Nietzsche speaks of. doesn't really mean super, it means uh, above. And it comes from, it's a Swiss term. Uh, and it's used for um, climbing, mountain climbing. And if you've ever seen mountain climbings, you're attached by a, by a rope. One guy's going up above and he ha hammers in a spike. Have you seen it in, in films if you haven't watched it? People do their, you know, their wall climbing thing here. I'm talking about real mountain climbing where you go up and you're hammering a spike into a stone cliff going up at like the Swiss Alps. And, and you hammer the, the thing in and, the, and then the rope goes through it and you tie off and make sure that you're attached to the rope because if you slip, that will keep you from falling and dying. And the one on top has no, there's no footholds. He just has to pull himself up by the cliff face or the mountainside, whatever it is. The man on the top is the Ubermensch, and the man below him is the Untermensch. But the connotations in the, co in the context of Darwin is there's an Ubermensch, and then there's Untermensch, and an Untermensch is the phrase that's reserved for races that are inferior. Slaves. Slavs, by the way, were connected with this. Sklaven. Um, but also all sorts of Jews, blacks. It could be a moral consideration as well, homosexuals, uh, people with mental disabilities, physical disabilities, as Unta mentioned, they're not fit for survival. And um, in the Nazi regime, this really gets taken on board as a scientific imperative and a commitment to efficiency and ideal to be pursued at all costs. And they, they see themselves as the Übermenschen, the Nazis. And Hitler drives the, Na the German people on to prove that they're fit to survive. And he doesn't care if they die in the process, by the way. That will just prove they're not fit to survive. So he does crazy things in, in, because of his commitment to the ideal, which is an all-consuming ideal. People um, who are um, analysts of the Second World War wonder at the extraordinary crazy things that Hitler decides they're going to do at certain points. But they believe that they're going to succeed because they have technology. And they, everything's being poured into science and technology. Right now, there's a movie called Oppenheimer, or it was out last year. And all of the scientists are Germans. They're pushing all of their, but, and there's an arms race, but it's a race for, through technology towards science progress that's going to demonstrate which of them is fittest to survive and the consequence of not surviving will be annihilation for everyone else. And they're happy with that. that that's, what the, that's what the film doesn't really capture. They're happy at that because it will, it will make them justified in their whole endeavors and otherwise they don't deserve to live. So there's a, there's a moral imperative of, of this is mankind without God guiding the discussions feeling that they must do this because somebody else is going to beat them to it. If not, and if they beat them to it, it's all over. But we can drop the bombs on the Japanese because they're into mention. They're, they're not going to say that there, but they are not fit to survive. It's going to cost American lives. Sure, that's part of it. But the other part is, so what? So the view of human nature, which is a racist one, is rooted in social Darwinism. And this idea of 
this devotion to efficiency, well, it's the efficiency of an idea and the idea of human perfection seen by defeating everybody else and dehumanizing them. That's the goal. It's not accidental, it's purposeful, it's intentional. This is how wicked it is. And this is what I think Marlowe is portraying here, um, or, or rather Conrad in portraying Heart of Darkness, is the idea of beating everybody else by literally dehumanizing them and, being un and not being bothered by it at all. And Marlowe, when he meets Kurtz, really wants to meet him. He admires him like no other man. He's so efficient. He is so committed to his ideals and his ideas. And Marlowe wants to be like this man. Very dark. So where is the heart of darkness? It's shot through all of the characters. The company represents it. Marlowe represents it. Kurtz represents it. And I would say that they do so more than the Africans that they come to colonize. They're portrayed as, you know, pretty, um, not very um, admirable in any particular way, but they're not, and, and they're not fit to survive. But they're not evil uh, or committed to evil in this particular way. Evil, which is their good. What is dark is, is their light. And that's the connection that he's making here at the outset of, of the story. So if you find this a uh, murky novella and difficult to, to pass through, it's in part because of the conflation things. And he doesn't bring any Christian context to analyze it because he doesn't think that it actually has any purchase on his reader's uh, worldview here. But that is what he's describing. It, final comment or question? Have I already gone well past it and sailed? That ship has sailed, okay. So I'll just leave it off to next time then. Um, and I will see you then uh, next class and we'll finish up.